And we're now recording. Welcome. Um, today we are going to discuss project management a bit more since we were not able to get to everything we wanted to cover last week. So we're going to start with project management and then we're going to move to editing and design, the units that you reviewed in the last week. And so at that time when we switch, we'll ask you to share your examples um, that, fingers crossed, you brought with you um, of an example of an instructional book that you really appreciate. Um, I put the link to our feedback in the chat. Many of you um, entered your feedback this morning. I thank you for that. Any detailed notes that you include are always appreciated. Um, someone, for example, said that it would be really helpful to have a sample project to illustrate the concepts that we've been talking about. And I really appreciate that suggestion. I don't think we had thought about it for these earlier units, but we're definitely going to be working with the sample manuscript um, starting in one week or two weeks when we start working on the well-formed document workflow. Um, we're going to be doing much more hands-on work than we have been so far. So our goal in these um, first few weeks is to really give a foundation in publishing, roles in publishing, and um, responsibilities or, or the workflow. And so editing design, editing and design, often called production, is really the final stages once the manuscript is out of the author's hands um, and into the hands of other editing and design professionals. Um, so I don't think I wrapped my feedback comment, but if you haven't yet, please um, put some feedback about the unit so far. Um, and I think now I'm going to turn it over to Elvis. And like I said, when we transition from project management, probably about half an hour, 45 minutes, to editing and design at that time, um, we'll ask for your feedback or questions on the units that you read, unless there's anything before we jump in that is um, holding you back or on your mind that we should address right away. I have one thing. Great. So uh, this is just a quick follow-up. I wasn't at the meeting last week and I was reviewing it and you know this keeps coming up, but the, uh, the CCNC discussion that happened, mm -hmm. Carla had mentioned that circumstance where a publisher said, oh yeah, this is an NC, even though we're selling this thing. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I could talk to her about it, but my take on that was that they can justify that by saying, the OER is still OER and it's still free. You're buying the platform. Yeah. So it's not a violation of the NC. Yeah, that's my so understanding as that well. Was my, that was my take on it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, th that's why the, that vendor was able to stand up and say this is legit. That's right. That's all. Yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those letter of the law versus the spirit of the law examples, even though we're not talking anything to, well, I guess we are right. talking legally. All right, thank you, Jeremy. Um, any other comments or questions about what we've talked about so far, things are on your mind? Alrighty, I'm gonna hand things over to Elvis, who's gonna talk a little bit more about your role working with authors. And one thing to keep in mind as Elvis is talking, of course, is his context. He's at Scribe, he's a professional in the publishing industry. Um, he um, doesn't bring the librarian or instructional designer, he brings the editor um, part of him and the project manager part of him. So there'll perhaps be some translation or sort of thinking about how it's gonna work in your environment. Um, but I think it's really valuable to get the sort of insider professional, how they're doing it in the publishing industry viewpoint. So Elvis, over to you. So hello everyone. Um, just like Karen said, um, uh, we come at it, me and Mike come at, at projects after sort of like we've dealt with like the authors and all that stuff. So uh, whenever we speak and we speak about project management, we often um, tend to go down the route of, you know, when we are actually already editing or uh, producing a book, if a book is not going to be edited. So, um, so yeah, so if there's at any point, if something comes up um, where I might be saying something that you're like, well, maybe unfamiliar with, or maybe you're thinking um, of project management at a different stage. Uh, you know, feel free to interrupt or feel free to let me know um, what you're thinking or what's going on. 
in your mind. So uh, to start things off, I want to ask a couple questions that we didn't get to ask last time just because of time. Um, we started talking about project management from the perspective of dealing with the authors, like that initial stage. And I do want to say this, and I'll repeat it often, it's that project management actually touches upon everything throughout the, throughout the life of a project. Uh, so in other words, when you are working as a project manager, there's never going to be a moment where you're going to be saying, I have nothing to do. There's always somebody to communicate to, uh, communicate with, some, but something to check, um, some, you know, something to transfer from one person to another, and things like that. Even though you might not actually be doing the work, like the copy editing, typesetting, designing, anything like that, um, you will have uh, sort of your hands on. And especially if you're like one uh, man, one woman, um, you know, uh, team or, or however you'd like to call it, um, you will have a lot to do as a project manager. And that's not to scare you. That's actually just to give you that sort of warning up ahead, you know, forewarning um, that uh, as a project manager, you will be doing a lot and you will have to communicate a lot and you will often have to repeat a lot of the things that you say to different groups because you want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. That is one of the main things as a project manager that you're supposed to do. So uh, to start off with these questions, I want us to ask, uh, for those of you with publishing experience um, and working with um, faculty authors, um, what was your experience? And like, what, like, like, was it a good experience? Was it a bad experience? You don't have to use names if it was a bad experience. Um, you know, what are the difficulties? What are the benefits that you've had uh, in just dealing with um, authors getting even to the stage where we'll later be talking about like actually working with a manuscript. So I'll leave that up to whoever wants to talk first. You can unmute yourself and, and answer. I am comfortable with silence, by the way, so I will wait. <laughs> I don't have very much um, experience, just but it's through the journal publishing. That's the thing, and and you know, sometimes it's really smooth, and sometimes it is horrible. You know. Yeah. They're, they keep wanting to make changes constantly. Uh, we can't, you know, tie them down to say, okay, which articles are going to go into this journal issue, you know? And, and so it's been uh, a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but this is helping me define what the pieces are that mm -hmm. we're supposed to be doing. And, and, and we're definitely calling them the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so. And sorry to interrupt, I'm just gonna jump in and repeat the question for Madeline who just joined us. So we're talking about um, people's experience working with faculty authors on a particular project. Um, it doesn't have to be a textbook. And so Myra was sharing her um, experience working with uh, journal authors. And so just to, to build on what you said, Myra, when things were really difficult, what were your coping mechanisms? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we actually tried to, um, I was working with another office who got the same kind of, you know, constant changes. This was actually for a conference where the conference changed up until to the first day of the conference. So, so um, you know, and, and we were trying to set some parameters like, we'll only make changes once a week, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, but but there was also a cultural one, you know, that when when you talk in that very, one of the chapters about the diversity inclusion, I mean, one of those things, it's a cultural issue. It's somebody from a different culture that just works and functions differently. And I have to take that into consideration. Um. Right. And this is, um, that's actually the perfect example of why we talk so much about project management and getting things set up in that very beginning. Uh, because if you're able to do that, then you can sort of diminish because you will always have um, authors or, um, or editors or whatnot that will want to continue to make changes to a, to a project even after we've sort of said, hey, no more changes after this point um, because it is their project. Um, and so what I would say is the best thing to do in situations like, like that where it's uh, difficult or it's challenging to sort of tell an author, like, you can't make any changes. It, you sort of have to get strong, and it's, it's, it's 
difficult sometimes to do with uh, with a faculty author, especially if they can you know pull back and say, well, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, but it really is to the benefit of the project if you hammer out as many of the details as you can early on, right? And we we'll, we'll say this a lot that it's it's better to handle things when um, you know a project is manageable, especially when we're talking about textbooks. Now, just to give talk about that context you don't want to be making changes and Mike will test to this like after, you know, the book has gone to print, right. Or like in our case, um, or be making changes at, even at the typeset uh, stage, because some of those changes like, yeah, hey, I want to add a new chapter, create a whole big mess um, in a project, um, especially if it's at that stage where it could have been done earlier. So it's sort of that idea of setting expectations and speaking with the authors. And sometimes you'll see that you'll spend, maybe hours, maybe days, speaking with an author and hammering out all the details and saying like, this is where I want things to be before we actually get into the stage of editing, and, you know, in the stage that we will call production. Um, but that's worth it. It's worth it to spend all that time up front to avoid some of those challenges. And, and I think that uh, Myra has, has said it clearly, like, you know, sometimes it's smooth. Sometimes you'll have an author that's like, yeah, do what you need to do. And off you go, and it's great. Uh, but sometimes you'll have an author who is not necessarily difficult, but they just have a different cultural mindset, or they just have an idea of where they want their project to be, and they'll, they'll, they'll think that their project is always malleable. And your job as a project manager is to sort of say, um, it isn't always malleable. There's, there's a point where you need to say, this is as good as it's going to get up to here, and maybe I can make my changes in another revision later on, um, or things like that. But all of this that, that we sort of bring up, um, we bring it up now in this early stage, so that way um, the author's expectations are set to where they need to be set um, and set correctly. So um, another I just question. Jump in yeah. there a minute. I was, um, this doesn't happen with, doesn't work with everyone, but I find that sometimes when authors come in with unreasonable expectations about how quickly changes can be made or how often changes can be made, it's simply coming from a lack of familiarity from what the changes they're asking for actually involve mm -hmm. and simply educating them on, oh, you've asked that I move page 10 to page 125. Um, here's what I have, what has to happen in order to make that uh, uh, manifest in the real world uh, will often open their eyes and they realize just how unreasonable their request is. What seemed to them to be something simple actually is more complex. And so you have to do a little bit of education uh, about what they're actually asking for. So. Um, I, um, I have had conference proceedings experiences, so I uh, sympathize with you, Myra. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'm wondering in a textbook environment, um, uh, would it make sense to uh, suggest to the author, you know, why don't you teach with the draft for one semester and see how you feel about it, and then, uh, then we'll go into the final stages of editing after that. I mean, would that help? Because I think for my particular instance, my instructor really learns from interaction with her students and her, and her colleagues because she is, uh, she is kind of like the um, discipline coordinator for about, I don't know, 10 lecturers or something like that. Um, would that help as a strategy? I think if just sort of thinking right now, I think that that would be a good way to sort of initiate almost like a feedback process where the, where the author gets to use their manuscript and then the students, as you said, can say, well, look, this didn't really work. I didn't understand this. And then they can make all these changes before we're even talking about editing and production and even just the project um, as a whole. So that's actually, I think, a, a quite a good idea and, a, and sort of takes in, into account our idea of putting everything up front, sort of saying, hey, look, work with this draft, deal with this, get the feedback that you need, um, and then come back to me when you have, you know, when you have either applied the feedback or you at least have the feedback and you're saying, I don't know how to apply it, but this is what my student said. This is what my, you know, fellow faculty said um, about my manuscript. Um, how can I apply this? And then you can have that conversation with, uh, with the faculty. Uh, Karen. Yeah. And, you know, we're not trying to, I think, create the impression that everything is set in stone. Mm -hmm. It's just trying to be mindful of, as Mike said, sort of the impact on 
workflow and people involved, particularly in this specific scribe workflow that we're dealing with. I mean, obviously, if you're in Pressbooks, someone wants to move something from page 10 to page 125, it's a different cut and paste process. But if the book is already typeset and designed um, and in the product that you know we saw with Karen Bjork's example last week, there is sort of a domino effect. Like mm -hmm. that one little change is not that little. And so, um, as Mike said, it's just a matter, I think, too, of education. So, Sunny, to your point, I love beta testing open textbooks in the classroom. I think that's a really cool idea. And then you can incorporate and acknowledge what the students have brought to that process in, in a later edition. And then, of course, though, there's also a later edition. So, it's not to say that, you know, it's just this one book, this one time. But to collect errata, you know, as you see OpenStax does, for example, and just kind of keep track of things that maybe aren't working, sorry, um, you have the um, opportunity to improve it um, in a future edition. And that's, like, that's the thing. We don't want to, as Karen said, we don't want to say, like, hey, you know, once you do this, your project is, like, unchangeable. Uh, we don't want to do that. But... Um, there is, as Karen said, that idea that as a project manager, you have to keep, well, as Mike also said, you know, you have to educate your authors to tell them like, hey, you know, I know you think this change is easy and you can just move this over here or add this over there, uh, but that actually has an effect. Like, for example, if you've, if you've typeset an index and, you know, everything is set according to the pages that, to that typeset right uh to that typeset file and now all of a sudden you're moving chapter three and it is now chapter 10 and things have moved around now your index needs to be completely redone which is more work um you know because even repaginating an index even though it seems simple it isn't um a lot of the um, the issues that that come up especially uh when dealing with authors is that as mike said they may not fully understand everything that's going on in in the background, right, or in the back office, right? Like a lot of the things that Scribe does, we sort of do them, and um, we've had authors say, like, wow, we don't know how you did that that fast. Um, but it wasn't that it's fast, it's just that we had multiple people with different expertises working, um, you know, on a project at, a, at one time. Um, so as a project manager, you have to sort of have that dialogue with the authors, and that's the important part, like always having that communication with them so that they are... Um, they never feel sidelined, but at the same time, they are being taught something new. Um, and it's not to be, I guess pedantic would be the word, um, but it's to just say, hey, you know, this is how things work in this system. And in order for, for us to create the best book that we can possibly do, we need to get to a point where, for example, you can't make any more changes or you can consider this final and you can consider any other changes for another edition or, you know, another revision. Um, later on, right? And so when we speak of this, we're, we're thinking of is that PMing really is this, you're dealing with the authors in the beginning, making sure everything is, um, you know, is up to snuff, right? Before you actually get to editing. Um, I heard somebody's mic. I don't know if somebody has a question. You can, you can ask. Uh, I had a question. So um, indexing cannot be regenerated automatically like table of contents? Even table of contents when we're thinking of files in InDesign, and I can, I can um, you know, pass that over to Mike. Um, there is certain things, like for example, you can say this page, you know, reflow to this, and you can go down and sort of do that manually, but I don't think that there's an automatic way, but I'll let Mike, who's a far better um, expert. Uh, yeah, you can regenerate a table of contents, but any uh, styling that you have done to make the table of contents itself more presentable, mm -hmm will have to be redone. Uh, and generally, uh, the uh, index process that we use, uh, it you do have to go, um, you do have to get humans involved. It's not mm -hmm. an automatically generated thing. Okay, thank you. So. I do believe that, oh, okay. go ahead, Karen. Oh, no, I was gonna transition. I was gonna transition, oh. so if you have something else to add. Okay, I will add that. Um, when think about indexing, I know we're working on um, on certain things for the SAI to be able to tag um, index terms so that it's easier uh, to generate an index. But even then, um, it still will generate some amount of work. It's not like it'll be a magical, like, hey, I pressed the button and now everything is, um, you know, to the page that it needs to be. So, uh, so Karen, take it away. 
Well, um, I think these questions are a really nice segue into our next topic around determining what a project may need um, in terms of developmental editing, copy editing, um, typesetting. You know, we, we're sort of um, touching on all of these things, but I think it might be helpful to take a step back and look at the big picture production workflow. This is kind of where project management unit intersects with the editing and design unit. Um, so just wanted to make that uh, transition for us. And so I'll begin and I'll be sharing this with, with Mike, but um, I'm gonna share my screen just for a moment. Um, I think everybody can see my screen now. Uh, this is actually the Wellform Document Workflow um, module on, um, on Canvas, uh, which you can access, but there's this image, which I believe Mike has made it available or can make it available so that people can download that and, um, and check it out, or you can download it from this, um, from this module, um, just so you can see it's the Wellform Document Workflow module. But what you can see here is that our workflow begins with um, the file at its source, which is after you've dealt with you know, all the stuff that we've been talking about, the you know, author management, getting things you know, ready. This is at the stage where you have a manuscript that the author has said, this is as much as I can do. Um, with this and this is ready to go into production. Um, so you'll see that our workflow um, consists of composing, which we'll learn how to do um, in a later unit. Um, and then uh, from co composition, we go to editing. And I'll, I'm just doing this briefly. We will talk more about this in the actual um, unit uh, that deals with this, but um, this is a good segue into what we'll talk about in a little bit, which is editing and design. So you'll see um, that from our composition, we'll go to editing. After editing is when you know, we consider this manuscript and this involves um, you know, the author having looked at it and approved the edits and all of you know, this back and forth. Once we get to this final manuscript stage, we enter into what we call production. And production is when we actually begin to uh, typeset the file um, and get it into a format um, like PDF and so on and so forth, right? And so throughout all this, what we will be generating, um, and this will seem like it's technical, but uh, we'll, again, we'll talk more about it later, we'll be generating um, SCML, which um, is an archivable um, format of the, of the actual manuscript. So that way, um, later on, if you want to make changes, it's, it's a lot easier. But I don't want to get too deep into that, um, as that's a little bit more technical and we want to save that for later. Uh, but once we have the files typeset, then um, we can move on and then start working with the electronic um, files, which are the ebook and Mobi files um, that are also available um, to um, the cohort members when uh, they decide to uh, create a project using our workflow. Um, and this is where the digital hub will come in. But again, we'll talk more about this as this is later, as this is just a small overview. And so when you're thinking of a project, when you're thinking of like this initial stage um, of vetting and, and, and preparing, uh, questions that you have to ask yourself are what services does the project need um, and who's gonna perform these services? For example, if you have a, somebody who has copy editing experience in-house, you may choose to leave that in-house and say, well, you know, I'm not gonna send that to Scribe or freelancer to, to copy edit that, I'm gonna use this person uh, in-house. Um, if you have, you know, designers and typesetters, you know, there is flexibility in where, like, who you use for the different parts of the project. And so you'll, you'll want to determine if the project needs copy editing or if it needs, for example, a deeper level of editing, what we would call a developmental edit, where you work along with the author to sort of bring their ideas uh, in a clearer way to the readers and to the students. Um, you also want to uh, see if you need a design or if um, you, know, you have a designer, for example, in house that has already produced something for you, um, or if this book will even need um, eBooks, um, eBook, um, EPUB, or Mobi. Uh, so you'll want to determine that early on, or like once you actually have the manuscript and you're taking a look at it, you'll say, okay, I know that this project is going to need this, because once you determine that, then you can determine how your project is gonna fit into the well-formed document workflow. Um, after that, what you'll want to do um, is determine um, when these services will need to be done. So for example, you want to set up a schedule that's going to work with whatever target deadline that you have. Um, here at Scribe, we use Gantt PV. It's open source, it's available online. Um, I believe we also have links to it in 
um, in the module that shows all the programs that we that we use and Gantt PV what it allows you to do is just set um, you know certain times and say okay copy editing will take two weeks so if I start copy editing you know February 13th then and I know you know by in two weeks time I need to have my copy edited files ready to be uh, looked at checked um, or ready to move on into the next uh, stage so um, the idea is is that you're doing all of this stuff up front so that way you have a good game plan um, to sort of tackle this project and make sure that the project goes smoothly. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to Mike now. I'm not sure if he wants to add anything to that before we continue. Um, I just want to, um, uh, yeah, bring up that part of the, um, part of the perspective you hopefully will be getting from this whole orientation course is you'll be better equipped to know um, what uh, services need doing to create a book and what people will need in order to perform those services for you, whether you're doing them in-house or whether you're sending them to a freelancer, whether you're sending them to a subscribe, um, that you'll, even if you don't know exactly uh, what needs to be done, at least you'll be better informed of what questions that need to be asked. And earlier in the project is better. Um, I, um, yeah, so we're going to go on to, uh, uh, does anyone have any questions before we move forward? Um, just want to talk a little bit about, um, bad things that can happen since you're probably going to be the primary custodian of the files that are going to make up this textbook. Um, Managing files is something most of us do every single day. It's not something that everyone thinks about thoroughly, and it's something that can cause you lots of headaches if you don't uh, if you don't give it a little more thought. Um, I mean, I, I I used to have more hair before I was a project manager, because, um, regardless. <laughs> yes, hooray for file management. Um, I would strongly suggest, um, no matter whether you're working on one project or you uh, have a pro publishing program and are working on a number of projects, um, set up a system for yourself of what you're going to do when you receive files from either your author or your freelancer or whomever and handle the files the same way every single time. Uh, the unit, uh, Karen's posting a link, uh, has an outline of what we do at Scribe, what our file structure is, what our folder structure is, um, and how uh, one of the things that's very important to us is when we receive a file, we make a copy of that file and we work on the copy, So, and we put the original in a place that everyone knows exactly where it is so that if something happens in the future of the file, we can always go back and see how it has progressed through the workflow. So we can track down exactly where the problem was so that we can know um, um, what else may have been affected and also how to prevent the problem from happening in the future. Um, so many of you are librarians. Do you have any suggestions for better ways, uh, uh, tips for file management that uh, you've come across since you're handling a lot of information already? Well, there's always the question of file naming. You know, how do you name each revision? And I think we, and, and I'm, wasn't there something about file naming in one of the? Yes. Things yes. already, you know, um, but it's 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 uh, it's complicated, and I know that we worked. I worked on an article with my colleagues, and we got to version W. <laughs> yeah. In the alphabet. Uh, so. Right, but you had established um, uh, that you were going to name them by letters of the alphabet, by which revision yep. they were, and thus everyone knew what was going on. Yep. This, this is, is great. 
this yes. is probably obvious, but you know, it, it will also oftentimes depending depend on if you're working on a team or working alone, if you're the only project manager, obviously you can have your own internal system as long as you know what it is, you're good. As opposed to maybe establishing a system with a team that everyone follows. You know, I know I've, uh, and that I come from an archives background and usually when you're describing archival collections, there's a pretty strict hierarchy of how files are managed and where they go and the individual file names versus the folder names and all that. So, um, yeah, that's I think whatever it is, as long as everyone's on the same page is the best way to do it. Uh, yeah, that's vital because you've already for weeks, we've been talking about how much talking there is in file in pro project management, how many questions you have to ask, um, and if you already have something uh, um, like a, uh, a file naming system in place, that cuts down on the communication you're going to have to have. So it's highly recommended. The uh, support material you have access to what we find useful here at Scribe. And wow. just to jump in for uh, Quick second. Um, for example, we, are, we here at Scribe have our naming conventions um, and our backup procedures um, for the express reason that, you know, there might be a day where somebody is, you know, out sick and something needs to get sent to, to a client or, um, you know, as David so eloquently put it, somebody gets hit by a bus and somebody needs to access those files. We need to be able to be sure that we're grabbing the right files. Uh, and making sure that you know we're sending the right files. So um, in those cases, the best thing to do is just have that naming convention. Make sure that everybody's aware of it. That way, if something were to you know happen to you, and maybe it's a good thing, maybe you win the lottery, right? And you never come back to work. Then somebody can pick up from where you were, where you were without you know having to say, oh no, I don't know which version of you know this specific manuscript, um, you know so and so left it at so um, yeah naming conventions and and our backup procedures you know even though it like, if you read the module may seem like a bit extreme maybe um, they're there for a reason because bad things do happen and sometimes good things happen and so we have to be sure to cover our bases um, because we want our projects to be able to be completed even if we're not around to complete them um, Karen uh, unmuted so I'll pass it on to her I'm unmuting for that uh, transitional sentence or two again, because I think, um, you know, with this resource and with your expertise and background, you all will find a way to manage your files. And if you have questions, we're here to support that. Um, and hopefully you're getting a sense of all the pieces of project management, particularly as they start to relate to production. Um, and so um, I'm just uh, looking at our lesson planning notes here. Um, I think that, um, you know, Elvis is going to talk a little bit more about editing and just a quick case study from the first co-op project and then relate that uh, to style guides, which is a natural relationship. And then we um, will move on to um, what we are uh, lovingly calling show and tell uh, when we hear from all of you with your uh, examples. And so um, a good way to sort of bring something in, um, even at this stage, um, when we talk about vetting, I do want to mention this. Um, when you have a document and you're ready to start editing, ready to start designing or typesetting, you always want to take a look at that manuscript um, and go through those questions that we have available uh, for you. Even if you don't know the answers to all of them, you can always contact us and say, hey, look, I have this manuscript and I think this needs this or I think you know this uh, project might need uh, whatever else it might be, uh, but you know you can always reach out to us and say, you know, help help me out here, and we'll always be willing to help because it's important to vet before you get into anything else because it's important to know what you're working with. So using that to jump off into into editing, the reason that we say editing is important is because sometimes you know uh, an author might you know, write their document, write their textbook and say, you know, this is great, this is perfect, right? But they're the only eyes that have seen it. Um, as an editor, 
you know, what we would do is then we would take a look at it with fresh eyes and we likely catch errors because we're all humans, right? Nobody's perfect. Nobody writes, you know, that perfect first draft, second draft, third draft, fourth or fifth, right? There are always issues. And when you want to present your ideas, uh, communication is important as we've already discussed. So when we are thinking about editing, uh, the reason that it's something that you should think about for your projects and you should never just say, hey, you know, this is fine. This, you know, this person's like, you know, an English professor, so they'll know exactly uh, what they need to say and how to write it and how, how the grammar and all that stuff and all the syntax is perfect. N never assume that um, because when we write um, and you can even catch it in your own writing, um, you'll, you know, type, mistype a word or, you know, you'll be rushing through something or you thought your idea was clear at first and, you know, it's clear to you, but it might not be clear to somebody who's reading it. So when we think about editing, um, we here at Scribe think that it's something of a necessity because oftentimes what you'll see, you'll have a project. I've actually had this experience where, you know, a client will tell you, hey, this doesn't need editing. This is perfect as it is. And when it gets to typeset and it's done and they get their final product, they're like, there are a lot of errors in here. And, you know, at that point, it's very difficult to go back in and make those uh, changes when it would have been a lot easier to um, copy edit. So I will also say this as a, as if you have like, let's say because of budgetary concerns, you cannot do copy editing and proofreading, which are two different things. Proofreading um, occurs after the file has been typeset and you're just sort of, it's a lighter um, look at the file than copy editing is. Um, meanwhile, copy editing is looking at it in this malleable like word format stage where you can make changes directly and even make suggestions to the author. Um, if you have a, choice between copy editing or you have to make a choice between copy editing and proofreading, then I would say choose copy editing um, because um, it's a lot easier to catch these things now, like in that early stage, than to try to catch them later and make those fixes. And now you have to get the typesetter involved in order to make the changes that you know your proofreader caught and whatnot. Yeah. Meanwhile, in copy edit, you can just have your editor um, you know, catch a change, make the change and give it to the author to give it a once over and you're good to go. So copy editing over proofreading. If you can do both, that's perfect because then that way you have multiple sets of eyes. And by the time you have your, your end document, your end book, your end textbook, you know that it'll be a good, you know, it'll be a good book. It'll be something that's, you know, you know, uh, spelling's correct, grammar's correct, syntax is correct, you know, punctuation's correct. Things are as, as perfect, as perfect as a human being can make it. Um, but, Again, if you have to make a choice, if you're going to choose something, choose um, copy, um, copy editing. So I want to give an example of, um, of a project that we've been, been working on. Um, so we actually got to the final stages of a, of a book. Um, so it's typeset. Um, we have, so we have the PDF, the ebook, the Mobies. We have everything, right? Um, and then about a week later, um, the author has come back and said, oh, I, I found some stuff um, and I'd like to make those changes. Now, you know, we're glad to do them. We can do them. That's not difficult, but it is going to cost, right? And it's going to likely cost, um, you know, the author, um, you know, rather than the institution to make those changes. So, you know, there is that, you know, monetary concern. Sometimes it looks like you're spending a lot on copy editing and you're saying, wow, that's a really high price. Um, but it saves you down the road. Um, sort of balances out. So rather than saying, okay, now, um, you know, now that this project is complete, now we actually have to go back and make some changes. Um, you know, at that point, um, it's kind of, it's difficult, right? So it's better to handle those things um, at the beginning, right? So we'll get into more uh, technical stuff, um, especially when it comes to comp uh, composing. And we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, some editorial concerns. But I do want to, um, I do want to show, um, something quick, so a quick tool that we here use. It's, in, it's inherent in Word. It's not like a scribe tool or anything like that, but we use it here while we copy edit uh, just because it makes the whole process easier. And that tool is track changes. Um, just, uh, I guess, by a show of hands on the chat, how many of you have used track changes? Okay. Very good. Good. So most people know. Um, so I'll just do this super brief. Um, I will be uh, uploading a video later on just showing how to turn it on and how to work it. Um, but uh, that is a good resource for just in case you're working with somebody on your team that has not um, been, um, was not familiar with that. So 
Let me just open up Word here, and then I'll share my screen quickly. The good thing about track changes is that when, when we think about the process of having, you know, somebody, you know, they have some text. Let me actually open up a file. Good find that one. Oh. Give me one second while I actually find the file. You can use this time to ask questions if you need to. I thought you didn't mind silence, Elvis. I don't. I don't. But I don't, I, I don't want to make other people feel uncomfortable. Um, that's my excuse. Okay. So, here you go. Okay. Um, you'll actually be, fam will be getting familiar with this because this is going to be um, a sample file that you'll be working on later, later. So don't freak out uh, with things that you see. Um, so when we think about track changes, um, what we're really using it is uh, as a tool to indicate to the author so that they don't have to reread their entire uh, manuscript what we're changing and why we're changing it and so on and so forth. Um, and what that does is that it also gives the author the ability to go back and look at their files and say, oh, you know, I didn't realize I had missed that comma or missed this. Uh, or even say, well, the editor didn't get my idea here, so this is actually what I want. So the easiest um, way to uh, turn on track changes is to go to the review ribbon and then click on track changes. You'll see that it's highlighted, stays on. Um, and so now any chance, any change that you make um, into a document will be highlighted. Any deletions uh, will be highlighted a different color and underline and any delet deletions will be struck through, right? And so since we know that these changes are not correct, right, on purpose, we can just go to uh, this next button here um, and reject, and that will actually reject the change and move to the next one. Um, and then we can reject all those changes throughout until we have no more, um, no more changes. And so what you would want to do when you're um, instructing an editor um, to, um, you know, when you're giving that over either, if you're giving it to us, we know that that's the process, but if you're giving it to a freelancer, you'll want to tell them use track changes because then that way you don't have to compare files, you don't have all this uh, sort of mess. You can just give the edited file over to the uh, author and the author can then review the changes uh, according to what they would like. What we recommend here at Scribe is that the authors don't um, you know, accept or reject the changes, but rather if they like a change, leave it alone, you can accept that on your own. Um, or if they don't like a change, you know, they can go in and actually make the change themselves. One of the ways that we um, sort of handle that um, is that we use this restrict editing um, option here. Um, if you click on that, what you'll see is that it'll come up here on the um, right hand side, depending on your setup in Word, and you can actually edit, you can actually restrict any changes so that they are always tracked. And you can enforce the protection, you can set passwords, uh, like for example here, or not. And then now, track changes is on by default, um, even if the um, even if the author uh, wants to turn it off, unless they know the password, if you've set one, uh, they won't be able to. And then that way, um, you can make sure that, like, when you get the files back from the authors, they haven't added a whole new chapter without telling you, or a whole new set of paragraphs without telling you, um, and things of that nature. So we use um, this inherent word tool to make sure that when we are editing here at Scribe, not only are we um, communicating effectively to the author uh, with the changes that we're making, but we're also um, able to check their work just in case uh, they might introduce errors um, later on. So I'll stop sharing my screen. There are any questions up to this point? No? Okay. And so as a final sort of touch on editing, again, this is a very light overview um, we don't want to sort of dictate to you that you have to edit this way. Um, we actually have made it um, 
quite um, flexible for you to edit in whichever or for you to indicate um, to the editor to edit in a uh, specific style or however your institution um, wants to approach um, the, the task of editing. So we've actually um, set up certain style guides, right? And you can find those on the module. I'll share those here. Um, and I think Karen has already um, shared the link. So here you'll see that there is the APA uh, style guide. So it's the OTN style guide, but uh, taking account for APA uh, recommendations and the CMS um, style guide, Chicago Manual of Style. Um, so it's it has all the stuff that the OTN uh, requires or recommends, and at the same time, it also includes um, um, Chicago Manual of Style recommendations. So, for example, you'll see here uh, CMS 9.26 refers um, to this use of numbers, uh, referring to pages, and so you'll see um, that is listed here. And this is something that you can actually download and then give over to an editor or use yourself if you're editing the document yourself. So that way, um, you're working with sort of a set of definitions that everybody uh, understands and so that everybody's on the same page. That's actually one of the reasons um, why we use style guides. So that way, if somebody else needs to take over or if somebody else is going to be reviewing the document after it's been edited, they can look at the style guide, familiarize themselves with it and not think, and not think, oh, well, this person, you know, didn't use the serial comma. Well, maybe for this book, the serial comma is not necessary or so on and so forth. Um, so uh, you, these are available to you. You can download them from, um, from the module on uh, Canvas. Um, and with that, I believe I'm going to pass it over um, to Mike and actually to the show and tell. So, Karen, I'll pass it over to you. And well, well we're, we're going to share it. There's a lot of passing yeah. happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a uh, final note on style guides, we put these together for you as, a, as an option to sort of rally around to unify um, the editorial choices that you may make for a textbook. There's also some codification of textbook not monograph in those style guides where we say like these are the textbook elements that you may include. Um, the front matter is very simple. We, we just require a, a sentence that says something like, you know, name of your institution is a member of the OTN Publishing Cooperative. Um, but all of that is laid out there. And as Elvis said, if you're working with freelancers or graduate students, you can share this with them as their guide so that they use it. But if you were working with Scribe, um, they, it's like imprinted on their brains. Um, okay, so this is where we're going to sort of uh, segue into... Oh. oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, do you suggest purchasing the really thick Chicago? I mean, I, it's down in the reference area, but I need to leave it in the reference area, you know. So do I need one of those 17th edition Chicago manual style that costs 70 bucks, a little less online? I know what the publishers in the house might say, but they're muted. <laughs> well, there it goes, unmuted. Um, I would say yes, um, just because, um, like for us here, it's our Bible, right? David will say, okay, yeah. So we we go off of that, and it's good. Either that, or you can get the subscription. Uh, I'm not sure how much that costs. I know we have that here, uh, but the subscription to the online version is just as good. Um, so uh, we do recommend uh, just having that as a reference, uh, especially if you're going to be working like in person with. Um, you know, let's say graduate students or something, um, it's good to be able to hand that to them and say, you got to learn this because that's what this book is, you know, based on. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I would say yes. Uh, I don't know if Mike has an opinion, but. Oh, just that with, as, since you're the publisher, if you want to go with an older version of CMS and say, we're not upgrading to, issue to volume 17, we're sticking with 16 because we were able to get a used, volume, used version, that's your right. That's a great tip. Like these choices are yours. These are recommendations. And a lot of it depends on how deep you want to go. Um, you know, we are giving a very um, broad view of publishing, but this process is more intensive than say, you know, publishing using a platform. We're, we're focused a lot on these editorial services. And so if you want to really like get to know um, the Chicago manual style or sort of that editing world, that would be useful. And if you're like, you know, I know that, I don't have the capacity for that, or maybe I don't want to go there. Um, I think that you can 
probably get away with not going there and knowing. Yeah, well, I use APA for the the journals and yeah. and, I, and you know I've got tabs throughout. I mean, the things that I use all the time that I go referring back to, and online doesn't do it for me in that kind of. Yeah, yeah. I'm the same way. Yeah. I will say this, if you are using APA, um, and that is what you prefer to use, especially because that's the field that the you know, textbook, is, textbook is in, then yeah, that's fine as, as well. That's not, uh, it's not saying like we have to make somebody who's writing a psychology textbook conform to CMS. If they're going to conform to APA, then that's fine. As long as it's consistent, it's okay. We do recommend CMS for like the, I think it's like humanities and things like that. Um, but Again, it's a recommendation and it's up to you to decide. As long as it's consistent and it's in a style guide, I think you're, you'll be golden. So um, as we often start our meetings um, asking you about your questions or your takeaways from the week's units or reading, um, I'm gonna just put that briefly to the group to see if there's anything you would like to raise before we move into the show and tell sharing of your examples part. Sorry, I have, Great. I think I'm still unmuted. Yeah. Um, um, it was actually for the production piece that the question came up, but I think that I, we could do some of it in, but for instance, I think we could do the typesetting piece if it's all copy edited and if there is a design for us to put it into, but would Scribe check it out for us? I mean, is there a price for checking, checking it out? Yeah. I mean, we are more than happy to check it out. And I, I don't know how it'll work with the OTN, but um, I don't think if there is a price, it wouldn't be too high for us to check out and give you something of, of some feedback. feedback on, yeah, you know, yeah. something be that we some, need to look at. Yeah. We wouldn't um, retype set it for you. Let's say that. Um, no, 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 no. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you yeah. know, and you know, there were a lot of things that just are not in my vocabulary and I kept mm -hmm. looking stuff up and, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, uh, even SCML, this, mm -hmm. you know, like it kept appearing. I'm going, okay, what is this? All right, so that's a scribe markup language, yes. Yeah. And then I still never found out what IDTT was. Um, but, you know, so there was a lot of um, terminology. Yeah, terminology. yeah, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, we are building up to that. And the reason we're building up to that is because we want to make sure that the conceptual stuff is there and we're, we're speaking in the same context rather okay. than jump into the technical stuff, which we actually did last time and did not, it did not work so well uh, as we have well attested before. So um, yeah, just as a quick, I guess, answer, um, IDTT stands for InDesign Tag Text. Mike can talk a little bit more about that, but I'm not sure we want to get into that right now. Um, so yeah, so it's simply it's the text that you flow into an InDesign file. So it that's all it is. And we will talk more yeah. about it in details, and we'll show right. you and give you some examples and all that stuff um, in later classes once we get more into the details. And we appreciate your questions, Myra. Yes, thank you. Um, can I ask the group? Um, whether I mean I've worked I've I've collaborated in uh, Google Doc and also in Microsoft Word. Um, has there been are there advantages pros and cons? Right now I think uh, we're using both formats uh, with my author. Um, any suggestions or um, warnings? So I would say that um, if you are using Google Docs, it's fine up until you're at the stage where we start considering com composition, editing, right. and whatnot. Because I think uh, Google Docs blows out all the styles and it just sort of replaces it with like, you know, formatting. So it renders like it like it's supposed to, but there's no styling behind it. In other words, like if you take that out of Google Docs and just and try to run, run it through anything, it's just going to be all like normal. Um, so what I would say, if, if your author, for example, prefers Google Docs, that's fine up until the stage where you can say, okay, we're gonna be moving away from Google Docs, so please make sure that you know, any changes that you wanted to make at this stage, excuse me, at this stage are, are made. Um, and even then, then you can say like, you know, we'll be working in Word from now on, but you will still have a chance to look at your file and look at your book before you know, we move it into the sort of more permanent state of typesetting um, and whatnot. So the, um, I think that the best way to sort of handle it is Google Docs is fine for the very beginning, but once you actually enter into the workflow, um, it's better to go into Word. 
Um, okay. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, I can, ver I can verify that. Agree with that. Cause I had a similar experience with mm -hmm. a report that we moved from Google docs to Microsoft word. Yeah. Um, and uh, I bet you, you saw it. It was just all normal. Yeah. That's, uh, well, you know, it's, it was interesting. Microsoft word kept the, um, mm -hmm. kept the look mm -hmm. that was assigned to each tag. Yeah. But it was really hard to use Microsoft Word to um, style it. After. Yeah. 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 They don't. They don't play nice. I don't know. I don't. Don't know if that's a company thing. But yeah, uh, Mike, I think you wanted to right. say something. Well, I can. Uh, as Emily said in the chat, that uh, Google Docs does work. Uh, it's set up for uh, people doing simultaneous editing, mm -hmm. uh, which can be helpful in the early stages. But later on, when you're having the author as a distinct person who will be reviewing it at such and such a time and the editor as a distinct um, entity that's going to be reviewing the file at a certain time. Uh, that's Google docs doesn't have anything to support like what Elvis was showing before about yeah. reviewing changes and calling attention to what was changed. It's mm -hmm. not really good at that. It's not really set up for that. It's set up for that simultaneous editing. So mm -hmm. that's where uh, word is going to serve you better. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay, so I'm looking forward to this part. Um, my fingers are crossed that many of you uh, were able to find an example of a beautifully designed or helpfully designed instructional book. Um, what we would like to do now is see your examples. If you had a chance to scan them, um, you can share your screen. If you didn't, um, you can hold it up to your camera. Um, and then just a really brief, like 60 second summary on why you picked it. And then we're going to connect your examples to why design is important. And Mike is going to share his own example. So who's going to kick us off? I'm going to, I'm going to keep this face until somebody kicks us off. I can, I can go. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Greg. I haven't, I, I just got a camera last week. So, uh, but uh, I'm from the university of Northwestern uh, St. Paul. And uh, I, uh, I don't have, it's not exactly a textbook, but um, let me share my, share my screen here. Uh, it's a, it's a text actually from project muse that, that I use uh, in a course, but uh, can you all see that? Not yet. Oops. Oh, here it comes. I think it's doing something. Yes. Hello? Yep. Okay. It's, it's, uh, there it is. We can see it. So this is a, this is a, uh, <clears throat> this is from a, oops. This is from a, um, uh, uh, the works of Martin Luther, uh, uh, the reformer. And uh, they were recently published um, again in this sort of annotated edition by Fortress Press, which is in, in Minneapolis here. And uh, I liked the design that they have to it because it's, so it's a, a primary historical text uh, with an introduction at the beginning. And this is just a chapter out of uh, like the second volume or something. But uh, one thing I did like about it initially is that when I, uh, was introduced to Luther in grad school and was having to read his some of his work. Uh, I remember very distinctly the um, the 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 book we used, and it had very little margin uh, around the edges, and it, it was almost just fully uh, text from top to bottom, and there was no real. Uh, design that had gone into it, and 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 then the uh, the lines themselves on each 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 line of text had so many words on them that it was you know quite annoying to 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 go through and read. So when I came across this edition, I really liked the layout, the the format of it. It's a little bit there's a lot of margins. Uh, there's a nice setup for the footnotes or annotations on on in the margin on the side, kind of not in the bottom, which is a little bit different and if I can scroll through it a little bit kind of each each page kind of has some you know some uh, some uh, uh, interesting historical 
uh, images or information that would go along with and help you look at the text and some footnotes may be regarded related to like languages or something. So it's pretty simple, um, but I found it much more approachable uh, to read sort of a primary source text like this uh, that, you know, that has annotations or something, but it's not just, you know, you, and you can get a lot of these texts for free on the internet, but they're, you know, you, you, you export them as a PDF and they're just these, again, they're just not styled very well uh, in those and from just an internet site. And so uh, this one kind of, uh, I think, uh, uh, has, a, has a good feel to it, at least for me. Yeah, thank you, Greg. I appreciate how you talked about all of the specifics, like margins, design, space, layout, and then you made kind of that um, judgment about it in terms of being approachable. So there's these pieces of design that add up together to your experience of that particular um, version or edition that you don't get on a you know PDF downloaded from the internet. So thank you for kicking us yeah. off. Mm -hmm. I can go. I can, oh, go ahead, Adam. Um, one of my favorite books uh, is, I don't have a digital version, so it's probably hard to see and it'll be reversed, but Design for How People Learn by Julie Dirksen. Um, and I've used this for some undergrad um, instructional design class. But I think it's a book about designing so that people can, so that knowledge is sticky. Um, and she does a really good job of making the book do that as an example of all that it talks about. So the main concepts of chunking things effectively. Um, she has a lot of the elements of a good, like headers, what we're going to get into in common words, not just objective speech, but then also a lot of images, almost no page doesn't have an illustration of some kind. And they're really simple. Like they're often stick figures, um, but they do a good job of using like subtle humor to draw attention and make the reader want to know what it's about. Uh, but there's very, like this kind of text right here is pretty rare. Usually it's all broken up effectively with um, main headers and subheaders and uh, a lot of tables um, like that. So it's just a really good uh, manager of memory and it ought to be because it's a book teaching about how to make memory most effectively embrace content, I guess. So I'd recommend it. So it's it's a walk in the talk, talk in the walk? You walking walking the talk, yeah. Walking the talk. Um, thanks, Adam. Yeah, it, some of you have given feedback about the Canvas modules in, in a very similar way in terms of like, I don't know if you want to use bullets here. It might be better to use this kind of, you know, visual cue. So we really do rely on those visual cues to tell us like, here's, you know, call out information, or, you know, you might be tired of reading blocks of text, you know, here it is and distilled in this way. So, Emily, I think you are next. Oh, um, can I just, Adam, can you again, or type in the chat the title of the book, please? Thank you. Yeah, so I took a look at a handful of different books and actually had trouble finding one that I thought was an example of beautiful design. Um, I looked at some books on the Open Textbook Network Library and some were just, um, like some were actually very helpful and good design, but maybe not beautiful. Like some that I looked at were Word doc PDFs. Um, and then I looked at some books that had been used um, from the library I was at before that were um, through the library, licensed through the library, but available uh, as ebooks. And so that was the one I ultimately selected one of those. Um, let me share this. It's this world prehistory book. And I don't even know if I think this one is a beautiful design, but I think it does have some helpful elements. Um, let me go a little bit deeper. So each chapter begins with a chapter outline, and I thought that was a sort of helpful way to introduce the text. And then there's a lot of breaking up of the text visually, like with that prologue. Then there are big chunks like this. This, I, I sort of thought, um, was some of the not beautiful part, but there are things like the bolding of key terms. Um, there are some images, Everything in here is just black and white. There are no colors. And um, to me, for an ebook, especially, I think color can add at least some visual appeal. Uh, 
but it does, I think it, of the ones that I looked at, this was actually one of the ones that felt a bit more broken up, um, more uh, different ways of visually displaying information. But overall, I felt like I looked at a good handful of books and found a lot that were just extremely text heavy, not much in terms of appealing design work. The sample one that I think was in this lesson, um, I found that one to be one of the most visually appealing books of the ones that I looked at. So, but I thought this one had some beneficial features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has some of those um, textbook design elements we've talked about in terms of calling out like you said, bolding key terms and having some images. And I appreciate that you did a survey and could kind of share what you found with us because, you know, it really does run the gamut and beautiful is um, a pretty high standard, but one I think we can reach. Yeah. <laughs> Other examples? Twilight. I have one. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, mine's similar to Adam in that it's uh, kind of a meta example. So I'm sure some of you have heard of uh, Edward Tufte. So uh, he's a guy who, besides uh, hating PowerPoints, he, his whole mantra is the effective display of information. And in, in this case, this is, I think this is, might have been one of his first books about quantitative information. So of course, there's going to be a lot of examples of graphs and whatnot uh, in here. But besides just showing you how to do graphs, you know, the book itself uh, it, it is very cleanly laid out. There's a nice use of space uh, littered throughout. So, you know, he's got on this page, there's this margin here going, things like that. It's also a unique size. It's not eight and a half. It's eight and a half by ten and a half. So it's a little bit more square. I think all his books are that way. Uh, you know, he's got nice quotes in here. And this book is like almost 40 years old at this point. And it's still, you know, looks modern. Uh, so that to me just kind of illustrates his vision for how to display information. And I think, you know, he's really gotten in the modern era, he's railed against how people uh, use PowerPoint and digital technologies and don't necessarily think about the, the most effective way to display, not just quantitative, but all information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the things you mentioned was his use of space. Like, I think we all really appreciate white space. Um, and sometimes that's easy to forget when you're trying to cram a lot of information into something. So thank you for sharing that classic example. Sunny, I think you were ready to? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm uh, fiddling around here. <laughs> um, I, I haven't, um, I've, been, I've been on the road, so I haven't had much time to kind of get prepared for this. Uh, let me see if I can get myself back to the chat. Okay, um, I have a link to a book <laughs> in Amazon. So, and I'm not, sh I'm going to try and share this uh, page, page view, but I'm not, let's see. I'm losing my cursor here. If this doesn't work, then sorry. Uh, Let's see, sure. Does that help? Does that work? Yeah. I have no idea what it looks like on your side because uh, yeah. I've just lost everybody. Uh, but um, I'm working with an anatomy and physiology instructor. And um, so um, their Bible um, is um, this Wiley text. And um, so you can see again, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of illustrations. There's blocked off areas of, of learning uh, tables, um, double column, uh, dual column uh, layout and things like that. And um, the um, textbook that I was looking at with her together also had some um, biographies and historical parts, uh, historical information in little blocks. So um, she, she loves this kind of layout. And so I'm kind of just we're gonna, I know what she's looking for, just in terms of this concept of stickiness, I think that Adam was bringing up. Um, her focus too is she's hugely diversity oriented. 
So there's, there's an opportunity to, to put in perhaps little blocks of discussions about diversity and anatomy and physiology. So um, uh, that's, that's kind of the direction that we're going in. So, cool. I I, I, it's great that you related it to the project that you're working on and you have a sense of what the author really values. I think that can be very helpful in later stages with um, thinking about how you want the design to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sunny. Okay. I don't know whether I closed it out. <laughs> we're, we're still looking oh. at your screen. <laughs> there we go. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Any other examples? Yes, Madeline? You're, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you see my book? Yes. Okay, I will not tell a lie. I just found it this second. <laughs> But it's, it, I think it's beautiful because it has this colorful um, text. If you look at, like, it's about women in digital arts and lots of white space. And I don't know if this is generally too expensive, but like bright fuchsia headings. I thought that was kind of expensive. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, considering the topic, there's a ton of uh, graphics. I'll just do a couple more. So even like front pages of chapters are colorful. Yeah, that full bleed is gorgeous. But that would be expensive, right? It would. Yeah. I mean, it would be expensive in the printing. Right. So this kind of thing. <laughs> Little bits of text and lots of images. That's all I got. Thanks, Madeline. I think you raised a great point about um, you, know, you want to be able to bring design, especially to topics that are related to design. You wouldn't want to uh, cover you know, new media or something and have it look like it was a PDF generated from Word. Um, you might lose some credibility with your readers. Um, and that I think also just speaks to sort of the larger picture, which we may have touched on before in terms of, you know, inviting your reader to have a certain experience um, and wanting them to read the book is going to go a long way in their learning as well. Any other examples out there before Mike shares his? Yes. Uh, I can say something else too. Um, I do some hobby work and some freelancing with role playing games. And actually those are maybe a good example of amazingly beautiful instructional texts Ooh. because they both have to be technical in teaching somebody rules and how to play a given game um, but also be um, compelling to both in the layout very much in the layout and art but also in the subtleties of structure elements that i think we've talked about textbooks needing so they would be most of my actual favorite instructional texts are all role-playing game books. Cool. Is it possible to share one with us, like either in the Google group or next time we meet? I would love to see an example. Um, I can try to think of ones that stand out to me. I just tried to look up the Mouse Guard RPG, Mouse Guard RPG but the publishers are pretty um, protective, so I couldn't do an Amazon look inside. Mm -hmm. um, I love that idea, though. It's um, a, a good one in design broadly. And that is look outside your discipline for inspiration and examples. So looking and you know looking to this to books on role play as inspiration for textbooks could be really powerful in terms of thinking outside the box um, and things like that. So uh, what a great example! Thank you. So mine is really like basic uh, because, as you all know, probably I'm on sabbatical, so I've been doing some traveling or thinking about traveling. So I have this book called The uh, Journeys of a Lifetime. It's actually put out by National Geographic and I've been looking through it to see where I might wanna have some um, bucket list items. And it's like other people have talked about, there's a lot of really enticing pictures and good text. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't scan anything. Um, but you know, and it goes on and has cultural pieces of it and all kinds of things to entice you um, to continue reading. And the table of contents actually is really good because it goes by different 
different types of trips. Sorry, it's really glossy. That's the only thing I, I don't really care for glossy. <laughs> but um, we've talked a lot about different things. Um, but this particular one um, is Iceland, and I've actually been there. But, and they talk about highlights of the different types of landscapes and things like that and different places you want to go. And they, they show you the, the road that goes around the whole island. You might be able to see down there in the corner. And uh, it's just... It, it puts me right back into, I mean, look at their really basic houses. And I don't know, can you all see that? It's a grass top mm -hmm. house. Yeah. Um, and so because I've been there, I, I know that it's authentic. And so I think authenticity of images and highlights and facts and things like that are really important to make something really, um, really pull you in as you were talking about. You want to bring the reader into the, into an experience. So that's just my yeah, thanks, Marilyn. There's also examples of contextualizing, like we saw on a map where these photographs are taken. Um, and so that kind of helps us flesh out and, and it provides different entry points into that information. And then Elvis, um, well, or I was going to say one other thing actually about that, Marilyn, you mentioned the glossy paper. That is another um, element of design. I mean, we're talking about the whole picture here and deciding like, is it matte? Um, you know, Jeremy really liked that the Tufty book was a slightly different dimension. It's not the usual. Maybe it's easier to hold in your hand or just the fact that it's not typical is appealing. You know, there's all these different sort of pieces um, that go into design. And then this is a great preview you found, Elvis. Um, or I, I don't know, Adam, if you would agree. But I think this is, <laughs> this is exactly what you were describing in terms of teaching something new um, in a way that's, uh, distilled um, in sort of chunks, bite-sized chunks, and it, a really cute illustration. Oh yeah, and Madeline put um, another example uh, in the chat of Nonstop Metropolis. Yeah, those are beautiful um, books. Anytime you get illustrated maps, um, I think, right? Yeah. Because um, I think she has uh, also San Francisco. Any other examples before we turn things over to Mike? These are really wonderful. I, I appreciate, and New Orleans, I really appreciate um, hearing from all of you and, and hearing about what you value and thinking about how that can apply in this um, cooperative. I can share something. Um, one thing that as an instructional designer we're always talking about is when students read the text, how do they know that they're getting it? Um, and so one element of some online textbooks that I've seen is instant feedback and self-check questions. Mm -hmm. um, I know in paper textbooks that can sometimes be like at the end of a chapter, like the one that Sunny shared had a bunch of questions at the end of the chapter. Um, but I really like when it's more integrated in each section of the textbook. So I'll share an example of what I'm looking at. Right. Can we see that one? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is a college algebra book by Lumen Learning, and it's talking about quadratics. I used to be a math teacher, so this is my stuff. Um, so at the end, there's a section where students can actually try it, and they can actually like answer the questions and submit it, and I'm going to get all of them wrong. Um, but they know instantly if they're getting the material on the page. Um, another one in an economics book, after they read the material, this is not necessarily beautifully designed, but at the end they have a section of just multiple choice questions that they can go through um, and answer them and see how they're doing. So that's one element of a textbook that I really appreciate and would like to see things incorporated more like that. Mm -hmm. That interactivity. It also had a lot of white space, which is something um, it has in common with many of the other examples. And I have been looking into um, incorporating that more into our Canvas course um, and need to investigate some different tools. Maybe uh, the instructional designers here can, can recommend something for Canvas offline, but because it's an openly published course, um, it's trickier because the, the data has nowhere to go. Anyway, that's an aside. Um, thank you for your example. <laughs> Is there anyone we've missed who would like to share? I think Nathan, you're the only one, but perhaps. Yeah, I have one to share. Oh, great. This is 
This is one that is um, older, a little bit older. Uh, the other designers recognize this. Essentials for blended learning. Um, it's a standard based guide, but I think that it includes a lot of the elements that we've been talking about with textbooks. I wouldn't necessarily say it's a beautiful textbook or a beautiful book, um, but I think that it's effective in what it does. For, let me give a good chapter here. For example, it'll give lead ins, it'll give to do items, call outs. It also breaks things into nice headings, section, section headings. Um, and when terms are used, they'll bold them, things like that. Um, I can't say that I actually use every element, but it's kind of a little bit like universal design for learning with instructional design. You may not necessarily incorporate every single aspect yourself, but you're including a lot of different aspects so that a lot of people can connect with it and from wherever they're from. So I like the fact that it includes a lot of different elements of engagement, even just ta even though it's mostly text and tables. But um, yeah, so it's one that I think is effective more than beautiful. Yeah, it kind of goes with a buffet style. So hopefully someone can find a, a dish that works for them out of those different elements in terms of um, what they take away or what they learn. Thank you. Okay, these are great uh, to get us started on why design is important. I think um, in many ways uh, you've already made the case. And so Mike is going to, I think, show another meta um, sort of example and just talk through um, the role that design plays beyond uh, decoration, which is how we sometimes um, think of it. That's probably one of our hidden goals here is to shift thinking away from uh, design as decoration to a something more. Yes. Uh, I just got to make sure. All right. So um, this is just a uh, textbook that I have. Uh, sorry about my phone camera. Um, it uh, scanned some of the text a little weird. Um, it's doubled up. It's not actually doubled up in the book, but, um, you know, this is just uh, an introductory page of a new chapter. We have the big drop cap that lets, um, the calls attention to the fact that we're starting a new chapter. Um, you know, a nice big, uh, epigraph up top. Typography is the craft of endowing human language with adorable, visible form. Um, here we have chapter titles, uh, nice and big and bold. Um, and then they're talking about the structure of typography and what uh, the anatomy of uh, uh, a typeset letter is. Uh, and they have these nice uh, descriptions with a lot of white space on the side um, and nice diagrams that <clears throat> call out exactly what the various pieces of a, of a letter are about. Uh, and this is a glossary in this particular book. Um, I really love this glossary uh, just because, you know, it's visually appealing as well as you know, giving you a visual example as well as what the terms are that are being defined. And the, here's a quiz in the back. Um, and... Uh, yeah, more examples of, you know, difference between Roman and Italic and things like that. So much like uh, a lot of the examples that, uh, uh, yeah, a lot, yeah, much like a lot of the examples that you came up with, um, um, are they, they were really great examples. I, I was really blown away. Um, so I, um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why design is important, not just for um, being beautiful and drawing people in and getting students to actually look at your book, which of course is there, is useful. Um, but the design will help your students, um, the students who use the book, understand how to slot this information into their brain right? They're going to visually pick up on clues of, um, visually pick up on clues on how things are laid out and uh, 
even if they don't couldn't consciously articulate what they're learning from that, uh, it will help them help orient them towards the text on what this particular piece of text is doing of what um, a bold head uh, is going to tell them that, you know, this is a new section. I need to like um, the stuff that follows is going to be on a slightly new topic. Uh, I need to orient myself that way. Um, if, and again, I don't have a visual, good visual example of that. If you're reading text in a book and it skips a line and then the text is um, indented left and right, uh, even if, no, if the text itself doesn't call it out, you probably know that that's a quotation from a different book, uh, what we would call a block quote or an extract. Um, and the reason you know this is because you've read lots and lots of books in your life. And what typographic standards are, uh, they help to reinforce across everything that um, students have read uh, how text is to be interpreted. So um, it's kind of ironic. Early, uh, earlier when we were talking about editing standards, I pointed out you can make your own editing standards as long as they are um, consistent. And while yes, you can make your own typographic standards as long as they're consistent that, oh, we're always going to treat uh, extracted text, quoted text in this way. Um, if you stick closer to uh, standard typographic practice, your students who are gonna be using these books will be better able to understand what you're going for because uh, it's going to be reinforced across everything they read in other courses and the like. So that's one of the reasons why sticking close to typographic standards uh, can help your students understand what's being said. Um, so uh, I, as I think you all came, came up with, uh, and as Emily particularly pointed out, design is easy uh, in the modern age with computers, but good design is not easy. Um, it's not just about how uh, you use your software tools about knowing how to use um, all the various toys that Adobe gives us to make something beautiful. It's knowing how to actually make something beautiful. And um, right, the, or, um, there are a lot of PDFs out there that were generated out of Word uh, and just as you can look at them and tell that that's where they came from, so can your students. And that gives them, um, that brings along with it certain assumptions of how seriously they should treat this material. Uh, you know, we always talk about uh, not to judge uh, something by its appearance, but sadly, that is, that is a fact of life that has to be, uh, dealt with. And so if you want to put your best foot forward, you want to essentially uh, convey to your students that we have uh, put the time and effort to make this uh, appealing and uh, plain, not plain, uh, clear for you. Therefore, they're more likely to put in the effort of understanding it so that they're meeting you halfway. Um, yeah, I'm referring to my notes here. Um, yeah, so just because you have access to Adobe uh, doesn't mean that you necessarily that someone necessarily uses it well. The software is just the pen. It's not the hand that holds the pen. Uh, another reason to, that I wanted to bring up 
I don't want to, particularly because just, just uh, not too long ago, we were talking about the advantages of Microsoft Word. Um, Word is a word processor. It's right there in the name. Uh, it's not primarily a layout tool. However, you can lay out a book in Word. People do it all the time. Um, one of the issues besides the um, uh, appearance baggage that I was talking about earlier that comes along with using Word is also the reliability of it um, because uh, when I open a Word file on my machine and you open the exact same Word file on your machine, things may not flow the same way. Uh, and then your index may be off and your table of contents may be off. So I would heartily discourage you from laying things out in Word. Uh, like I said, you can do it, but you'll give yourself a lot of headaches. I can promise you that much. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to talk about. Uh, anyone have any questions? I, I have an example of um, cross platforms and MS Word. We had like a 400 page <clears throat> accreditation report that was um, um, uh, produced most at, in both platforms. The final platform was on um, a PC. Um, and then uh, we did the finishing touches on um, Macintosh. Oh, when we sent it to the printer, there were two colors. The black text was had two tones, um, which was not apparent until it was on print, in print. And that was so painful. So, yeah, that's just an example of um, uh, issues working with Word. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for sharing your pain. <laughs> <laughs> that is rough. <laughs> um, so, okay, so we're kind of at the period where we um, regroup, check in, and plan for our next meeting and answer any questions you have. So um, just to kind of review what we've covered today, the link that I put in the chat just now is to the well-formed document workflow, which Elvis talked through. We have not taken a deep dive into this workflow. We will do that in the future. But we wanted to share this with you ahead of time to show you the relationship between all of these different stages and that as a project manager, you are working with the manuscript at all of these different stages. So um, hopefully uh, when you come across that again, it'll serve as a good point of reference and you'll um, be able to kind of imagine what each of these stages are and what you may be doing to support your author and support the project at those stages. Um, we also talked about editing and design and the standards used for those two processes. So in editing, perhaps it's APA or Chicago manual style. The CMS also includes some typographical recommendations like Mike talked about in terms of block quotes. Um, but I don't think there's like a separate typographical um, guide or manual um, for all of these sort of rules that we've picked up and internalized through years of reading. Um, this is really kind of wrapping up the publishing fundamentals portion of our cooperative training together. And so hold on to your hats. We are going to move into the more technical part of our training together uh, when we meet in two weeks. And so to prepare for that, I just want to double check that everyone has, um, and I think they have, but I would like a few more sets of eyes here, that everyone has entered their information on the Google spreadsheet I just put in chat. This is for the Scribe Hub access. Please, um, if you don't see your information there, go ahead and uh, enter it. And if you have successfully logged on, Please put a note there just so we know, okay, this is working as planned. So Emily just added yes. Thank you, Emily. Um, don't worry about column E. Uh, if you have done it, awesome. So far, so good. Um, if you haven't, we'll take a few minutes in two weeks to install it together. But it looks like we're not missing anyone here. 
Okay, Thomas, is there anything I forgot about the hub? Do we, oh, do you wanna try, if you haven't tried logging on to the hub yet, why don't we just take uh, two minutes to try and log on? Can you, um, would you mind putting the URL to the hub in the chat? It's gonna link right to it. Yeah, so if you, if you haven't logged in, now would be a good time because um, I could actually fix um, any issues um, now and then that way we'll be good to go uh, in the coming weeks. Jeremy, would you, um while everyone's uh, checking out their hub access, would you wanna show us your, do you have Word open? We can see if the ribbon's there. Yeah. Thanks. Hold on. Sure. Saw oh, something in. I thought maybe it was under the developer thing, but was yeah. it, is it supposed to be its own ribbon? Yeah, I think it's supposed to be its own ribbon. Are you on a Mac? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, then you have to load it uh, slightly differently. Mike, do you want to um, guide him on how to load it since I'm on PC? Oh. Um... Hmm. That's a different version of Word than I have. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a toolbar called, um, I have to load up Word. Uh, yeah, I'm loading it up too. Yeah. <laughs> if we can't solve this uh, quickly in this call, we'll consult with you uh, before the 27th. Mm -hmm. okay. But um, let's just take a look, because I think there's maybe, is there anyone else working in Word? On the Mac. On a, or sorry, yeah, on a Mac. Yeah. I think if you go sorry, to macros. Go tools. Okay, tools. It's for tools on a Mac. Okay. Um, but like I said, my I have a much older version of Word. Yes. Uh, so yeah, it's so, the menu is sub menu item is called templates and add ins. In preferences. Yes. Yeah. Is that where it is? Let's see. I don't know. Can you, in preferences there, can you search for uh, templates? No, that's. Uh, hmm. All right. Well, I'll, we'll look it up. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And get back to you. Okay. Next week. Yep. Uh, Marilyn, we don't know. Marilyn left. Oh, I think Ruth is no longer. Okay, I'm just gonna make a little note here. Adam. I have a question. I'm not yeah. able to log into the hub. It says I need to confirm my email address before continuing and I'm not getting any email about that. But I did go to somewhere else way back when and got SAI Lite. Okay. Um, does that suffice? Because I didn't, we, I don't, I didn't get that from the hub. I'm not sure yeah. where I got that. So the SAI Lite is uh, an available tool. It's almost like a demo, like a trial version of the SAI. Um, so it won't have as many things, and I think it loads a little differently than everything else. Um, so I'm going to get you access to the to the hub so you can get the full SAI. Okay. Uh, I can actually do that right now. Um, I have a real basic um, type setting question. Um, I remember reading, uh, I think Michigan State had a handbook on, on you know, publishing guidelines for their um, 
espresso machine. And they were suggesting a um, serif font. Is that for, that's, that's easier to read? Is that still, is that a thing? Uh, um, most books are set in serif fonts that are, are set for prints. Yes. Uh, does that mean that just because you go with a sans serif font that it's not going to be readable? No, there's plenty of sans serif fonts that are readable. Uh, I would say you just have to know what you're doing a little more, be a little more familiar with it. Um, but sort of standard is to use uh, serif fonts for, for text. For, for text. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so as we're troubleshooting um, a couple little issues, I'll check in with Marilyn and see how she's doing. And then Adam, I think we're working on getting you sorted. Madeline, you're in. Great. Thank you. Um, if you want to try installing SAI, as we've mentioned before, um, I put the link there in the chat where it says scribe add in SAI. There is a video of Elvis uh, calmly talking you through how to do that. Uh, so you can give it a shot if you want in advance, and then um, if you would come back to the spreadsheet, let me know. Then we'll just have a good sense um, on the 27th of kind of where we're at as a class, um, how much time we might need to take, but it's really um, advantageous for all of us to try and troubleshoot anything that comes up for you individually, um, and we're happy to do that, so just uh, let us know. But we will also walk through the installation in case, um, in case you would like that help. So, Karen, um, yeah. Okay, so because three of my sessions have been here at home, some, somewhat on my home computer, so should, I, so should I just put the SAI on my home Word too? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you, yeah, sure, put them, put them wherever you're going to be working. Well, obviously, it looks like home. <laughs> <laughs> working from home sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> So this yeah, winter is you, done. Can, you can you'll do it twice and you'll be one of the most experienced and you can uh, talk everyone through their installation. Okay. I did find the templates and add on thing. Oh, great. Um, I'm and gonna then, share the screen again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Right and then um, in that center section wow. where it says global templates and add-ins, yep. after you run the SAI setup, mm -hmm. um, uh, you'll have another line there that'll say SAI.dotm. Right here under the Zotero thing. Yeah. Yes. And, and then, then I would just you'll click, click that, um, and then you'll hit OK, and that's how you'll have you'll turn it on. Okay, I'll try that. So, yeah. And I'm, I'm also on a Mac, Jeremy, if I remember right, when you click that checkbox, it's like, are you sure you want to do this crazy thing? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so you just have to say you're really sure. Okay. Okay. Um, so I wanted to check in. I'm sorry. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, check in about next week where we have uh, the floating hour that I mentioned previously. So what we have planned on Wednesday, February 20th, there is a webinar with Kevin Hawkins from 12 to 1 Pacific. He's going to talk about how should you publish, which in some ways um, will be additional information to what you're getting here in the co-op because he's going to talk about different ways uh, in addition to the co-op. But um, I would like to hear from all of you if you would um, like to just kind of call it good, get an extra hour of your lives back, um, do what you will during that time, or if there are topics that you would like to revisit, um, you know, something you feel maybe we haven't covered or you're on shaky ground and you would just like some, some Q&A time, we'd be happy to do that too. So you tell us, please. The following week is when we move into well-formed document workflow, as we mentioned, the more technical part, and we'll start with the SAI installation um, and move on to, to composition. So back to the question of the floating hour. Uh, Nathan would like uh, an hour of his life back. Understandable. Got other stuff going on. I'm seeing nodding. <laughs> Is 
Okay, this is expected. All right. Great. Since only two people have said anything so far. But okay, but three people. Okay, nods. Great. So we will see you in the OTN webinar with Kevin Hawkins next week. Um, and then we'll see you a week after that for two hours. So every class meeting after this, we're pretty sure it's going to be the full um, two hours. I know some of the earlier ones, we got a little more time back. Um, so please, to prepare, take a look at Unit 6. Um, the notes we have uh, to recommend to you are, you know, you're probably not going to get it looking at Unit 6. There's going to require some hands-on time together. I certainly wouldn't be able to get it just reading through the unit. But the idea is to present the information to you um, for familiarity so that you're not hearing it for the first time when Elvis and Mike start talking about it, but that you kind of have um, some scaffolding for it. So again, um, the idea is that you're kind of getting the gist of what we're talking about, but that you're not walking away with the, with the technical know-how for it. Um, the final thing I think I would like to highlight are the sample files um, that you will find in that unit. As we mentioned, we're going to start working with sample files. You're going to get your hands dirty, so to speak, working um, on using the SAI. So um, Elvis put a link in. Is this what we, is this, should they go there, not where I put them? No, that's just a, that's just a mistake. No, that's just don't panic <laughs> when oh, they start oh, reading. I didn't get it. That's encouragement. <laughs> Thank you. That's the don't panic encouragement. Um, but the, the Canvas link that I put there in the composition unit, you'll see uh, sample files. So Elvis, there's an uncomposed file, a composed file, and a homework file. At this point, you can say, grab them all. You can but, grab them all and keep yeah. them. Yeah, but we what we really want you to look at is the uncomposed file. We left the composed file there so that you can compare it, you know, and sort of see where things are going to be. And then that homework file is the one that we'll actually be working on, um, you know, and having you look at and and whatnot. But um, you should grab everything at this point. Um, there are other files up here, but I think this is the the, the main uh, set of files that you need. So when you look at unit six, please download the three sample files so that you have them handy. Take a shot at installing SAI. If it doesn't work out, we'll spend some time on it um, in two weeks from now. And I think that's it, unless there are uh, questions or comments or other feedback for us. I will say, take um, as you're going through this, um, you can you know take a shot at composing that uncomposed file. Just look at it, work with it. Um, you're not going to break those files, and if you do, they're still up there. So um, nothing will break. Um, your computer won't catch fire. So I do suggest just like poke at them uh, and and like sort of learn that way. If it's it's easier that way to uh, to get the information to stick. And as a final, probably, reminder, um, I will also say that this is another example of something that we're offering for you to learn, but you may decide you don't want to learn. Um, we're just trying to give you um, all the information possible into this particular process. Um, Kathy Labrador from UConn is going to come for a couple minutes and just talk through, you know, how she's internalized this information. She's, again, someone who did a deep dive into it and has really appreciated getting to know every technical detail. Um, Karen Bjork mentioned composition. She trained a team at Portland State how to do it. Um, but you could decide, I want nothing to do with this. Um, happily, I have a budget, and I'm going to ask Scribe to compose the file. Um, but it is still useful information in terms of thinking about how files are structured, how to create hierarchy, um, how to create a, um, uh, can't think of the right word, um, uh, can't think of the right word, a particular file um, that has some integrity to it. Um, and I've lost my train of thought. So I think that means it's been two hours. And uh, it's a delight to see you all again. Thank you so much for bringing your examples. It was really fun to hear from you all and, and see those. 
And if you have anything come up um, in the meantime, before we see each other face to face again in two weeks, please uh, use the Google group and reach out. Alrighty. Thank you. Farewell.